Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Center for International Governance, or CG as we say. Uh, my name is Fred Koontz. I'm the Vice President of Public Affairs at CG. Tonight's signature lecture is co-sponsored by CG and the Balsley School of International Affairs located here at the CG campus. I'd also like to thank CG's public event sponsors, 570 News and Wordsworth Books. Besides the audience here tonight, we have a global audience watching on the live webcast. Uh, following tonight's address, we welcome questions from the audience either at the microphones here at CG or if you're watching online, you can ask questions to the live chat function on your screen and we'll transmit those questions to our guests. Our subject tonight is Broadcasting Revolution, How Media Have Influenced the Arab Uprisings. Our guest speaker tonight is Habib Bata, and I'll say more about him in just a few seconds. But first, I'd like to mention our discussant this evening following Habib's address, and joining him on stage will be Bess Momo Mani. She is a CG Senior Fellow, a non-resident Senior Fellow at the Brookings Institution, and a Professor of Political Science at the University of Waterloo and the Balsley School of International Affairs. A frequent commentator to the media, Dr. Momani is a global governance expert in Middle Eastern foreign policy and international financial institutions. Habib Bata is a Beirut-based journalist, filmmaker, and media critic. He's been covering Arab media for publications and broadcasters in the West and in the Middle East for several years. He's also contributed to CNN, Variety, BBC World, MTV, and others. He's focused mainly on social impact and public diplomacy at pan-Arab satellite stations, including the major Arab Gulf networks, Al Jazeera and Al Arabia, as well as an increasing number of Western and Asian state-backed outlets now broadcasting to the region in Arabic. Habib has covered Lebanon's media scene extensively and has written on mainstream and social media in Syria and Egypt in relation to the Arab Spring. He has a BA in journalism from the University of Texas, an MA from New York University, and just last year, he won the EU Samir Kassir Press Freedom Award for investigative journalism for his piece on uh, the Jewish uh, community in Lebanon. So please now welcome Habib Bata. Okay, how do I get this uh, going here? Get the screen on. The projector. Oh. Oh, okay. Um, there we go. So, um, thank you for coming. This is a picture um, of Gaddafi's compound in Libya. And when it was taken over by the rebels, we can see the flag of Qatar right there flying over it. Qatar is a very small country uh, with pretty much no military to speak of. Um, and Qaddafi's Libya was, had a massive army, one of the biggest in the Arab world, hundreds of tanks. Um, and yet this tiny little nation um, with, with, with a population under a million, well under a million, was able to hang its flag over one of the most powerful leaders uh, in the Middle East. So this is the, really the story of how powerful media has become in the Arab world as a tool. And we're seeing many governments now um, that want to start media in the Gulf countries. The Emirates has now a new channel. Um, Qatar, uh, Saudi Arabia has a channel. So we're seeing a lot of interest in this. But what I want to talk about today is these are all really big corporations sponsored by governments. I want to talk about people, young people, and um, the the citizen reporting and citizen journalism, which is now challenging even these challengers of other regimes. Um, so I want to show you. Uh, the, the, now, the Syrian government, like many governments in the Arab world, has tried to keep a lid on the media coming out of its country, it's tried to keep a lid on the message. Um, and it has failed, um, like many governments have in the Arab world. Um, because the Syrian government has clamped down, has stopped journalists from reporting in Syria, uh, or restricted their movement so severely that they can't report, uh, we have seen this emergence, this explosion, of citizen journalists covering the story, taking it upon themselves um, to, to make up for the lack of journalism in their towns and cities. And I want to show you an example of this entire year 
of war has been covered, one of the first wars probably covered entirely, um, mainly uh, to a large extent by citizen journalists and not reporters. And this is what the kind of videos that we're seeing constantly in the Arab world today. A video from Homs, Syria, about two weeks ago. under attack by shelling. So he's, he's saying that the town is under attack by the military aircraft and that it also hosts a lot of rebel fighters in the town. Um, now, just like this man is running, telling a story, we're seeing this pattern throughout. We're seeing a whole generation of people that were never expected to be journalists that have become reporters in their towns um, by force or by accident, and they're being trained as reporters in war in the worst circumstances. Um, and not all of these journalists are just filming battles. Some of them are also doing a bit of reporting. You'll see in this report. On the humanitarian situation. So we can see the state of the the lack of uh, food, the garbage in the streets, people's issues, people's problems. These young uh, people, young amateurs, are going out and reporting, almost as journalists would, on the problems in their towns and cities. We forward here a little bit and see that uh, people are queuing up for food and water and a lot of scarce. People are trying to get gasoline, desperate situation. Why don't you go to school, he asked them, because the school is closed. Now, these videos get aired. Um, they're not just on YouTube, and they're not just available to people who have internet access, because we know that in the Arab world, uh, people on Twitter and YouTube and Facebook are a very small minority, about 1% or less in many cases. But these videos um, do get shown on the major Arab TV networks, the satellite TV networks like Al Jazeera, that reach almost 90% of the region in some in, in places. So while you might not have internet, the broadcasters are out there and picking up these videos from the internet and broadcasting them to homes across the region. And um, you know, just to give you an idea here, I want to show you a, an image. Even in, um, you know, even in shacks, uh, this is a shack in Lebanon near a construction site. Now, Syrian workers in Lebanon live in these construction shacks, and they have no plumbing. Um, they wash themselves with buckets of water. Um, they make probably like $20 a day, but they have a satellite dish. And, 
And recently, I was talking to some people um, living in a container, in a rusted container, a group of uh, maybe 20, 25-year-old Syrian refugees, three months. Um, they had been living in Lebanon. They escaped Syria. And the first thing they asked me was if I could help them download Skype on the BlackBerry. Um, and they were living in containers. Um, why is Skype important? Uh, it's not just about Twitter and Facebook. Some people are using Skype now, uh, Skype groups, to broadcast news. So any way information is getting out, it's getting out there. And these people, they might not even know how to use um, email, but they know how to use Skype. So um, I think we need to be careful when we talk about um, the limited impact of social media because it has many ways in which it reaches mass audiences. Um, now, these aren't just individuals that are out there filming these things. More and more, we are seeing a development, an evolution, I would say, um, where we have groups forming. Okay, um, Let me get this for you right here. And so even, even you can tell the older generations that might not be connected are still you know, watching the main TV channels. This is a typical street in Beirut. Uh, people are out playing backgammon and watching TV through the window in their shop. So the TVs are on everywhere, um, and they're picking up those, those videos. I just have one more slide here I'm trying to find. OK. Um, so what's happening, though, is that we're seeing people form groups, individuals forming groups, and these uh, brands, um, for the first time in Syria, you know, the Syrian government, like other Arab governments, held a tight grip on the media, didn't allow for anything but the government propaganda on television, and now you have all these people forming these new media networks we never saw before in Syria. Um, and these are actually, some of them, such as Sham, uh, which means uh, Damascus and Ugarit News, are national opposition networks. They have Facebook pages. They have Twitter pages. They gather videos from across the, the whole country. They air them. But increasingly, um, we are seeing local media. So we have cities and towns in Syria, like Latakia. We have the Latakia LNN, Latakia News Network, um, very, uh, a smaller town. We have uh, the Deir Zur Press Network. Um, so these cities, these secondary cities, are getting their own media for the first time. That's very significant because, uh, because of the media strategy of Arab governments, the focus of these government propaganda channels was on the capitals. Uh, so Damascus, Cairo, et cetera, that's where the media focused their attention, where you have a city like Homs in Syria with a million people and having really no media of its own uh, or, or much media to speak of. So for the first time, people are covering local news. Local news is a new concept. Uh, across the Arab world that's happening a lot in Syria especially. Not only is it local news, but we have something called the Baba Amro News Network. Now, Baba Amro is a neighborhood within homes, so we're having even a hyper-local news um, networks. And these are all um, publishing on Facebook and, and et cetera. Um, what we're also seeing is the emergence of these new uh, networks and brands. Here's one called Duma, Duma City. Okay, so a town that people, you know, one of these guys living in the container, he told me, I never even heard of Baba Amro before, and he's living in another town in Syria. So people are learning about towns they never heard about in their own countries. Um, and, and Duma City and, and Baba Amro are now new news networks. Um, so where in the past we had these two, Sham and Ugarit, national opposition networks, now people are going to the town's news to get their news, not just the national. So we're seeing that um, footage and having your own media outlet is very important politically. It's a kind of, uh, footage is a kind of political capital now. And so uh, uh, it's almost as important as having guns and having aid supplies and having footage. These are kind of the three components now of the Syrian opposition. And because we see there's so many, these are just a few of the dozens of new media outlets. Every, so many towns and cities have their own news. Um, we're seeing this is kind of a reflection of the fragmentation of the opposition in Syria. Uh, every situation is different. Every town, every neighborhood might have different media outlets. Um, not every neighborhood, but in certain cities there are uh, uh, up to 10 or 15 different local councils within one city. Now we should see this uh, development as part of the latest chapter of the Arab media revolution. So 
um, for the past 15 years, actually, there has been a revolution in the Arab world, not in the streets, but on the airwaves. And that all started mainly with Al Jazeera, uh, which was launched in 1996. And um, this channel really um, changed the face of television news in the Arab world, because television news, as I said, we have 22 countries in the Arab League, probably had about 22 plus or minus propaganda channels, one for each country. Um, so Al Jazeera actually came in from a small country like Qatar and decided to go and start saying uh, news that wasn't good about Arab leaders, um, start broadcasting things that painted them in a negative light. So this um, really angered a lot of Arab governments uh, and they kicked Al Jazeera out. But as we can see, Al Jazeera today, 15 years later, is still one of the most popular channels or the most popular channel in the Arab world. This revolution in the media in the Arab world also took place in the entertainment industry. Um, we had uh, the beginning of reality television in the Arab world, also about uh, 10 years ago or so. And this caused a lot of controversy. We had shows like Star Academy, um, which is a reality show, kind of like a American Idol, okay? And the contestants get voted on. You can see here they're waiting for their percentage of their votes through telephone voting, SMS. The shows brought men and women together, young men and women together from all countries, Morocco, Tunis, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, etc., to live in a house together, these contestants. And um, that was very controversial because dating in many Arab countries is, is not allowed. Um, and uh, living together in the same house, hugging and kissing your co-star, this, this made a lot of people very angry. A lot of clerics especially were very angry. They issued fatwas or religious edicts against these shows. They tried to shut them down. Big Brother was shut down right away um, in Bahrain. But then we had this show emerge, Star Academy, and now it's in its like seventh or eighth season right now. I can't remember, but uh, uh, the show is still going strong. Now, Saudi, the, the, way, the way this show is, it works is that people vote for their favorite contestants. But then people are also allowed to, to text their own messages. And if we kind of see here, there's a scroll bar where it will run text messages from the contestant, from the viewers at home. Um, and here we can see. So here are all the young people um, uh, on the couches, sitting on each other's laps. This kind of thing was very ang uh, angering to a lot of uh, uh, clerics and conservatives. And on the bottom of the screen is the text scroll. So people are SMSing, oh, I love this candidate. He's from my country. Uh, she's so cute, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and this, uh, this kind of drove the, the Saudi authorities a bit crazy. Um, so they try to ban the SMS texting to these shows. Uh, so again, but the, the government, uh, the people in the country actually went around the ban because the government controls the telephone network and they started voting for the contestants over the internet website. Um, and, and so despite all the government's efforts, the Saudi government and the clerics' efforts, uh, actually a Saudi contestant won the show uh, on the second or third season. So um, we really saw, the, the, we really saw uh, the, the, the loss of influence of the government over controlling the message, and this is in the entertainment industry. What we're seeing now, I think it's the latest chapter, we're combining the interactive elements of, um, of, of, of these kind of shows and the, the, the kind of defiance of Al Jazeera, and we're bringing it into uh, the, the creation of new media channels. I want to show you also um, another example of the media uh, defeating power, political power in the Arab world. Uh, during the Egyptian revolution, uh, the Egyptian government tried to block the signal of Al Jazeera. Uh, and what happened was that uh, Al Jazeera's signal was scrambled, but ch television channels across the Arab world, uh, in solidarity with Al, Jazeera, with Al Jazeera, broadcast their signal. So we see this is a Lebanese channel called OTV. They broadcast Al Jazeera's signal. This is a Lebanese channel called NBN. They broadcast Al Jazeera's signal. This is Al Jazeera thanking all of the other TV channels for broadcasting their signal when Mubarak uh, tried to defeat them. And this is what Al Jazeera looked like on screen. It was black, but the other channels carried it live and defeated that. Um, and they even tried to put cartoons in its place. Um, so again, another example of the succession of failures that we're seeing by these governments in, in controlling the message, whether it be social or, or um, political in nature. I want to show you a couple more videos here. Um, now, another thing that we're seeing is, is that Al Jazeera, 
we know it is uh, owned by the Qatari government and it has a policy which reflects that government's foreign policy. Al Jazeera um, is not covering local issues in Qatar. Anything that gets close to home is, is um, you know, even the revolution in Bahrain is not very covered very well. So um, the reaction to this is, is we're seeing more and more local media, um, local stations. And people taking up cameras. So I want to show you some other examples, if I can find them. Oh, here we go. As I said, now the, the broadcasters like Al Jazeera, Al Arabiya, they're, they're very strong on Syria. They're showing the brutality of the regime. They're not really talking about what's happening close to home. Um, and, but that is now changing because we are seeing now citizen journalists in Saudi Arabia. And this is a recent protest. You wouldn't see it on TV, but you would see it on the social media. Within Saudi Arabia, in a mall, it's where Saudis protest. And they're protesting for um, the release of people who have been detained. Let me see if this is gonna load. The video will start shortly. So this YouTube channel has again branded itself and used uh, this ticker saying breaking news. They're trying to, you know, emulate the news channels. And here we see the people marching into the mall. You won't see this on Al Jazeera or Al Arabiya so much. It's not just politics, though, and um, we're seeing the use of social media in a lot of contexts. Um, we had in Lebanon, for example, an internet regulation act that the government was trying to implement. And there was a big campaign on Twitter and Facebook to stop this government legislation. And they called it the Lebanese Internet Regulation Act, Lira. They came up with a hashtag on Twitter, stop Lira. It went viral. Everybody tweeted it. And um, even anonymous uh, people are uh, admiring anonymous and trying to emulate that. And in the end, the government, the minister said, well, we're going to rethink this law. So, you know, in years past, before Twitter and Facebook and this kind of social media reporting, um, an organization among individuals, grassroots organization, a law like that might have easily passed and, and just slipped by the books without anybody um, uh, putting up a big fight over it. And I want to show you one more interesting example of, of citizen media, and this is toward corporations in the Middle East. Corporations also need to be held accountable, just like governments. Um, even in small issues, we can see the rising up of people uh, to, to claim their rights. And this man was on an airplane. Let me explain to you clearly. He was on a Lebanese airplane, and the airplane had broken seats, uh, broken uh, video, uh, bad service. He decided to get out his camera, film the, uh, the people, ask them what was wrong with their service. And, um, and this went on the blogs. It, went, it, get, it got viral. You know, Lebanese, are, it's a small community, so everybody was talking about this airplane incident. Uh, the airline actually banned the individual from the website. But then as more and more traffic came in, more and more tweets, and, and, and people posting this message in these videos on their walls on Facebook, the company actually came out with a big apology. And then the local news media then picked up this guy's report. This is a major Lebanese TV channel. And we'll just watch it really quick here. So he's saying this guy took it upon himself to film what passengers were thinking. Okay. 
بعرف انه اسالوا له الطياره الاجر قال بحيث ان احنا رح نكبها اساس انه بيست ولبنان مرتاحين بشكل انه الطياره اذا بدها تفت ريفربشمنت So he's, he, they're talking about, he said that the, the, the stewardess told him, well, this is an old plane, we're going to get rid of it. And he said, really? So we just have a small problem on our plane, we just throw planes away. So these messages really resonated because corporations in the Middle East, just like governments, have, have been really unaccountable. So she's saying in the end, the reporter signs off saying that because of social media, every individual has become a correspondent. Um, and and the, 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 uh, the airplane has apologized, issued a big long apology, changed its total strategy of banning the guy, issued a huge apology when it got this big. And it got this big because of people at home on their computers, on their Twitter, uh, Twitter pages and Facebook pages. Um, so I think uh, there are a lot of challenges to talk about here. Uh, we can't just say that this is great. Um, there are a lot of um, issues with uh, citizen reporters. Some people don't even want to call them citizen journalists. Um, because of the very serious issues of accuracy. Uh, in Syria, uh, we have, activists have told me that they have done things to make videos look more exciting. Uh, they've told me that they have burned tires in the street to make the shelling, the smoke from burning tires, magnify the impact of the shelling for the sake of the cameras. Um, we have, I have heard that uh, casualty numbers have been exaggerated. Um, people want to, you know, people really think that that's a way to get their message out, to make it, to exaggerate their story. So we are seeing exaggeration. And then we have the networks like Al Jazeera um, and the other, its other rivals, uh, its Saudi-owned rival, Al Arabiya, both very interested as Gulf countries in getting rid of the government in Syria, not being, being very lax about these videos and allowing all kinds of things to air on the on their screens that might be old videos, they might be recycled. So there are a lot of dangers here, but I think the net effect that we're seeing, um, and, and journalists that follow this constantly can tell the fake videos. Um, it's kind of a margin of error, not the rule. Although the regime says these are all fake videos. They take one video that has an issue, they say, oh, these are all fake. Um, so uh, that line isn't really working, though. And I think that um, uh, we are seeing a margin of error, not, not the rule. Uh, because thousands and thousands of videos have been uploaded from Syria. And we can't say they're all fake. Especially the first video I showed you, there's no way to really fake being shelled um, like that in the city streets. Um, so what, what I'm hearing is that people, people believe that these young journalists, the more they get together, these uh, people are becoming journalists for the first time. We're seeing more and more journalists in cities and towns and rural areas that never imagined being journalists. And they're getting together, forming new brands, like the brands that I showed you, each one with their little corner screen logo. Um, and uh, people believe that within time, some might close, some might consolidate. And these could be some of the Al Jazeera's of the future. And uh, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Habib, for that very interesting presentation. Um, we're, we're encouraging you all to, to please uh, fill out that form or, or put down your question, and we will be collecting them and asking our, um, our guest here your questions. So we look forward to that. But I'll take a few minutes, if I can, to just pose a few to you. Um, you know, one of the things that you pointed out, that there are, um, there is an industry now, there's really like a cottage industry almost in the sort of YouTube world to sort of get the more horrific, the most... Uh, um, appalling videos, and clearly we know that you know the international community has, uh, you know, uh, reacted historically when these images are displayed on our television screen. And I wonder, you know, in, in your opinion, are we are we going to see as this conflict in Syria, for example, continues to deteriorate? Do you think we're going to see more of this kind of sort of? falsification of news as, as the stakes get higher and higher? Um, yeah, I, I think that uh, the, it's going to be an inev inevitable problem. And we have falsification of news in the mainstream media as well. So we have to remember that uh, a lot of uh, stories that are run by the major broadcast networks in the United States, in Canada, everywhere, we have a lot of issues with media. So we're going to have those issues. Um, I think that uh, people are, are actively watching this sphere. And there are a lot of people that are involved watching this. And, uh, um, 
I, for example, once tweeted something and I had a, a, a small uh, issue with, with, with what I was saying. And within like one moment, I had like seven people who told me, well, no, that's not right, you know? And, and so uh, people are watching this very closely and scrutinizing it. So as much as uh, there are fakes out there, there are, there are many people out there watching the fakes as well. So we have to realize that I think the net effect is that the good material mm -hmm. rises to the top and the bad material is, is jumped upon and tramped upon and, and shouted upon and people want to also make names for themselves by pointing out stuff. So I think uh, it's kind of a free market of, of criticism and ideas and, and stuff rise up. But there is one concern that I want to touch upon, which is the rise of some of these new, uh, now I talk about internet channels, but there are also new satellite TV channels across the, uh, in Syria, about a half a dozen new satellite TV channels. So also reaching out to the traditional media, in addition to the new media, these channels broadcast from Saudi Arabia or from uh, Egypt or from uh, London, for example, into, Saudi, into Syria. Now, some of these channels have taken on a very sectarian tone. Um, one of these uh, channels has a, a, a very uh, firebrand cleric who, who has said things like, uh, the Sunni blood is one, and Alawites that fight with the regime should be fed to the dogs. So there is also the danger of having very sectarian, hateful media. And we've seen that in Iraq as well. We've seen a lot of channels in Iraq, um, anti-Shiite, anti-Sunni channels. Um, so there are uh, going to be a lot of uh, negative things that happen as well in this, in this media revolution. Yeah. Well, one of the things that you know, is really interesting about um, um, the satellite televisions in, in, in the Middle East is that there's no subscription costs. Mm -hmm. you know, so you buy the terminal, you install it for in the range of two to three hundred dollars, and there you have satellites. So you know, unlike our, well, we have, we have issues here in Canada with the really appalling costs of satellite television. But we, we pay a lot uh, per month, you know, and that regulates the, the market, if you will. Um, in the case of the Middle East, as you know very well, you know, we have a thousand satellite channels, um, some of which maybe perhaps 50% is junk. Mm -hmm. um, we know that it takes, what, I think $80 million, $80 million I last heard to get your own personal satellite channel. Um, so, you know, every millionaire, every billionaire, I mean, we know this very well in the Middle East, you know, sort of anyone who has a little bit of money is creating their own satellite channel. And we're dumbing down the conversation. When did, would you say we're at that point where we have too much? Um, you know, I, I remember, I mean, I think many in, in the audience too, when we had, you know, five channels to choose from, you know, there was the, the few that you could, and now, I mean, it's endless. I have a thousand channels. I have the rotisserie channel sponsored by Swiss Chalet. Um, you know, I have a lot of unnecessary channels. You know, is this, are we at that point now in the Middle East where we can say there's a lot of junk Yes, there's tons. There's a thousand channels, like you pointed out, um, and probably about 20 or 30 of them have content, actual programming. Um, uh, there are more than that, but I'm talking about a really a, a full grid of programming. Um, I tend to think, though, that the more, the more cameras we have in the Middle East on the streets, the more people um, witnessing uh, things in front of them, and there's plenty of things to witness every day mm -hmm. um, that's not being covered. So we have such a... Um, uh, such a surplus of, 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 of a need mm -hmm. of, of coverage that at this point um, I, I wouldn't discourage uh, at all of the proliferation of these channels. And it's also not happening only on TV, but now there's more of a focus shifting away from TV and to the internet, and it, whether it's Skype or Facebook, et cetera, uh, more people are getting connected and uh, looking at alternative media. And I think that the good things will rise to the top. I think out of those thousand channels in the Middle East today, a lot of them are watched by almost no one. Mm -hmm. um, the ratings are very low. Even the United States, um, France, have all launched Arabic language news channels over the past 10 years. Uh, and these are big budget channels um, trying to you know, get their kind of agenda across and their ratings are almost nil. Mm -hmm. um, so people are, viewers are very sophisticated, I think. They're not gonna really watch stuff that's, um, uh, that has low quality. Mm -hmm. And I think that, I think again, I think the good things will, will rise up and whether it's online or on television. And actually, it can backfire, right? I mean, you're the, Ira you know, the Americans, for example, launched uh, Al Hurra uh, in Iraq, which spent most of the time really talking about how life is great, mm -hmm. uh, you know, showing wonderful scenes of people being happy, and, and it really was not a reflection of reality of life on the street. So it actually increased anti-Americanism among the Iraqi people who were quite frustrated with the occupation and knew that outside uh, the matter was was really quite devastating. 
Um, can I ask you, you know, I noticed sort of two trends in, in, your, in your presentation. You know, on the one hand, you were talking about how all of these channels were leading to fragmentation in the sense that we have these little you know, fiefdoms now um, in parts of Syria, for example, that are creating their own channel. And similarly, on the corporate side, even we know, you know again, millionaires are now increasingly deciding to create their own channels uh, throughout the Middle East. But at the same time, we have a phenomena of sort of nationalism, Arab nationalism across the region. So where before, you know, someone, a citizen of Morocco, never used to see what a citizen from Jordan is like. And now you have this new sort of Arab nationalism across the media landscape where they are watching Al Jazeera, where they do have programs like Star Academy. You know, how do you sort of, how do you see these two trends? I mean, do you think we're going to see more of these sort of, sort of sophisticated nationalist kind of networks like Al Jazeera thrive or... You know, one of my favorites is one called Fetafit, which is like basically a food network for the Arab world. And it, it has, you know, a chef from one country almost every hour, you know, and, you know, so, so you want to, you, people in Lebanon are learning how to make a Moroccan dish and people in, in Lebanon are learning how to make a Saudi dish. And, you know, that's sort of a new sort of Arab nationalism. Mm -hmm. Can you sort of reflect on what you think is sort of the, the, the trend moving mm. forward? Yeah, I think it's it's two ways. I think it goes also nationalistic because of the reality shows especially. Mm -hmm. uh, we've had so many reality TV shows and the contestants come from each different country. So unlike, you know, they're not contestants based on their personality as much, people are voting for them because of their country, the Jordanian candidate, the Egyptian candidate, the Saudi candidate, etc. Um, that also kind of is kind of divisive, I think, too, because mm -hmm. people kind of root for their, their country, their native son. Um, but at the same time, we are, uh, because of television, television is a really a great nationalizing, uh, Arab regionalizing factor uh, because of the fact that, you know, we have Egyptian programs, Syrian programs that are very popular across the region. Now we're having collaborations between Egyptian, Syrian, Lebanese, Kuwaiti, um, Emirati, different, different uh, producers getting together. And some of the shows that we're seeing are having actors from different countries as well. Um, and yeah, in the Arab world, uh, we are pretty distant. Um, from each other. I think that people often do know little about the countries around them, mm -hmm. even though that there's the idea that the Arab world is this kind of monolith and that they're all kind of one. It's actually not the case. I think people really know little about, uh, le many Lebanese know little about Morocco. They probably mm -hmm. would go on vacation to, to France before going to Morocco mm -hmm. or uh, other countries similar. So um, at the same time, though, I think that it's important that we have this local effect and that we have more media about the local, your town and your village and your city. Uh, so I think, yeah, it's, it's working in both directions. Yeah. You know, you really pointed out in your presentation about the effect of Facebook and Twitter to sort of name and shame government, which mm -hmm. is obviously in uh, a region that is probably the lowest in achieving sort of scores of democratization or political liberalization. That's a really powerful and new tool uh, for people demanding new kinds of rights. Can you reflect on sort of the activities that you've seen work? I mean, you gave us the example of the Middle East uh, Airlines, but we'd love to hear sort of yeah. other examples, the campaigns that, uh, that worked. Um, they're still new. There's not a huge number of examples, I think, but um, I, I also give the example of the, the Lebanese internet and we had the, the regulation being fought over. Um, accountability is one of the greatest effects of this social media revolution, I think. And uh, we saw accountability with Al Jazeera on the state level, and now we're seeing it on the local level with these new outlets and, uh, and individuals. And, and, and hopefully we're going to see more accountability on the local level in municipalities. Mm -hmm. Municipalities throughout the region are not really the focus because everybody thinks about the capitals, talks about the Arab-Israeli conflict, but what about your municipality and your village um, and your mayor and where are the budgets? Are they transparent? Um, so I'm hoping that that will be the next uh, stage. Um, as we saw in Saudi Arabia, there are changes happening. In Kuwait, mm -hmm. um, there was a, a, a campaign through text message that helped get people out um, in the streets yeah. protesting certain legislation. They actually were successful. Um, so the examples, I think, are, are still coming. Um, but, but these are some of the main ones that I, I guess I, I, I see right now. I think that... Uh, they're happening all the time, actually, in, in many countries. It's stuff we don't really hear about every day. Are governments getting more sophisticated about now using social media for their purposes? Mm. Yes, they have Facebook pages, the government TV channels, um, and a lot of Thanks. likes on there. Uh, 
people. Government officials? I mean, are they really getting involved? In yes, yes. Uh, I, it's funny because uh, uh, now the news media in Lebanon, for example, uh, has stories about uh, not just um, you know video soundbite of what this politician said, but what did he tweet? You know, so we'll bring up in the evening news the tweets of the prime minister, and we'll talk about them. Uh, and, and, and what did the prime minister say? And people are really, even also in pop culture, Haifa Wehbi is one of the um, famous pop stars in the Arab world. She had a big uh, controversy recently about what she was tweeting with, with someone, um, how people react in their tweets. Uh, so there are more and more ways to really hold people accountable and, and monitor people um, and, and make things public. And, and this empowerment of individuals that really had no power at all to be part of the system are now engaging and talking to people mm -hmm. on Twitter. And so we have the prime minister responding on Twitter. But also these officials, I probably like officials in other countries, have people run their Twitter accounts. So it's not always clear who is tweeting, mm -hmm. if the prime minister is really tweeting or if it's somebody tweeting on his uh, behalf. Um, one of the, the telecom minister in Lebanon is one of the, 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 the uh, biggest tweeters. So we have a list in now in Lebanon of who tweets most, which ministers tweet most, the president. We have stats on their, their tweets, the prime minister, the president. Um, so yeah, uh, even during evening, you know, political talk shows, we'll see uh, a politician get out his phone and, and, and read, you know, uh, his emails uh, on, during a talk, political talk show, heated talk show. So technology is really getting all, all over the place, uh, whether it's from the official level or the, or the individuals. Yeah, that's great. What do you think is sort of, um, sort of the untapped opportunities that, mm. you know, the broadcasting business, so to speak, hasn't quite figured out in the Middle East. I mean, what's, what's on the cusp of happening that you see that you think is coming down the road or mm. that we should be coming down the road? You have a lot of investors possibly in the room if you have a good idea. <laughs> um, well, the expansion of, of, of pushing these boundaries mm -hmm. is what's happening and, you know, from, uh, from Al Jazeera onward. And, um, and I think that the one region that remains kind of very um, virgin for mm -hmm. journalism is the Arab Gulf region right. um, and that's where all the money is uh, and all the big uh, broadcasters are and, and they've done a really good job of covering other countries but mm -hmm. within Saudi Arabia, within Qatar, within ba all these countries, uh, Bahrain is a, a bit of a, an ex uh, exception um, but uh, journalism is not really practiced in a lot of right. ways. It's very sycophantic, very um, praising the leader, etc. Uh, nothing is wrong, everything is great, the economy is wonderful, the king is wonderful. Um, so there are plenty, there's plenty of places where media is not operating, and these are just very kind of small upstarts, what I've been showing. And I think one of the biggest things lacking in journalism in the Middle East is investigative journalism. Mm. Um, so we have a lot of reactive uh, statements, and even Al Jazeera and these big channels, they really kind of, it's a very surface level of reporting. We don't really see the kind of undercover camera, you know, mm -hmm. months long, year long investigation. We need a we have, Aldo Rivera of the Middle East. Perhaps. Uh, we do have a lot of talking heads, a lot of shouting, mm -hmm. um, a lot of emotions on television, but the kind of studied, long-term, uh, really investment in programming mm -hmm. and really good quality programming. I mean, it, it's telling that today in the Middle East, the most popular programs are dubbed Turkish soap operas. Right, yes. So where is the local production industry when, you know, when dubbed content is, is more, uh, more popular? So there's a really long ways to go in terms of production values. Yeah. Um, some of these shows do have you know, pretty big budgets. A big budget is considered five or six million dollars or more, which is still, you know, uh, uh, there's a lot to be desired, I think, in terms of uh, the relevance of the shows, the relevance, mm -hmm. the, the issues being covered, you know, really kind of getting bolder and bolder and bolder and going out there and talking about stuff because there's plenty that's not being talked about. Well, it's interesting because, I mean, it has made its way on print media. I mean, sort of investigative journalism is popular in the Middle East, sort of, you know, finding out the ministry that's corrupt or finding out why, why are, you know, gas prices going. I mean, all these sort of, you know, real social issues, for example, mm. are uh, really um, investigated quite nicely in the print media. What's the challenge or what's the reason why we don't see it take it to the next level in terms of broadcasting? I, I don't know. I mean, I don't know that it's, I, I think there's still a lot to be desired, even in the print media. Mm -hmm. I think that um, there's a lot of accusations about people, but kind of less systemic right. analysis. Um, and, and a lot of um, uh, general statements about corruption, mm -hmm. um, but less specific names and individuals and, and really kind of studying the system. What's it going to take? Uh, I think that these, 
everybody's being, there's a lot of push and pull effect with all mm -hmm. these new media. So we see, uh, like I said, uh, the news, the traditional media reporting on Twitter. Um, recently, one of the Lebanese channels did a live stream of shooting in the streets. Mm -hmm. So people on Twitter started talking about the live stream on the traditional broadcaster. So there's a lot of influencing and pushing um, uh, and pressuring. Um, the entertainment channels in the Middle East, uh, NBC Group, for example, uh, started as an entertainment channel, and then with Al Jazeera uh, being, you know, so popular in news, they kind of were pressured into, uh, or kind of influenced into going into news as well. Yeah. So we're seeing a lot of uh, influence back and forth, and I think now that the, the lo local news citizen journalists having their cameras like this guy um, at the, on the air flight, yeah. getting on all the major broadcast media, that's kind of pushing them to, hey, we should be doing more investigations like that. Absolutely. I think so. Um, I think a lot of pressure will come now from this newly empowered um, uh, generation of, uh, of, of, of tweeps and, 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 and cell phone video holders. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think it's, you know, pointing out sort of the cell phone, uh, you know, as you noted, you know, internet connectivity is still, um, still weak, generally in the Middle East. I mean, we're, it's improving rapidly, but everybody has a cell phone. Some people have two cell phones. I mean, it's sort of silly, but in some com countries where, you know, there's two carriers and, and it may be cheaper to actually have two phones rather than call the opposite carrier from one or the other phone. Um, you know, are we seeing sort of the video journalism in other places other than, you know, hot zones or conflict zones like, like Syria making an, an impact? You mean just new media in general, mm -hmm. new media enterprises? Yes, definitely. This is not limited to Syria. There are dozens of new channels that have been birthed in the revolutions, uh, uh, local channels, and uh, Libya has many new channels, Tunisia, uh, Egypt. Um, I've heard that there are 200 new publications in Libya alone mm -hmm. since uh, over the past uh, year or so. Um, so yeah, it is definitely spreading. Um, and I think that you know, we're gonna see, see more and more of that. Are we gonna see more, you think, foreign investors come in and capitalize on a very young demographic, for example, in the Arab world? Are we gonna see more well-known international investors come to the Arab world and, and launch their own uh, media channels? Well, we've seen that. Uh, Rupert Murdoch has just recently launched, uh, helped launch with the Emirates, the UAE government, uh, Sky News Arabia. And uh, it's actually very interesting what they're doing. I think I would call this the empire strikes back <laughs> um, because uh, there are now more and more uh, news channels being launched by millionaires and billionaires uh, trying to react to this social uh, media situation. Uh, we have Walid bin Talal, who is uh, one of the most prominent billionaires in the Middle East. Um, launching a news channel with Bloomberg, mm -hmm. um, a partnership with Bloomberg, so business, very business friendly, probably, station. Um, so we have the Bloomberg, we have the Sky Arabia, we have a new channel, uh, a new kind of pro Hezbollah TV channel mm -hmm. that's emerging on the scene, uh, that's international uh, audience and scope and uh, sophisticated, a lot of money there. We don't know where the money um, is coming from exactly right now, it's kind of been hard to find out on that one. So we are seeing, you know, at the same time, these small kids with laptops and cell phones and uh, running around the streets, and we're seeing, you know, the millionaires and the billionaires throwing in their money, Bloomberg getting involved, uh, Murdoch News Corporation getting involved. So yeah, we are seeing, uh, uh, there's, I, I mean, there are probably um, more channels, news channels available to the Arab world than most regions, you know? Yeah. I mean, uh, uh, France, Russia has a, a channel, uh, an Arabic channel, China has two, Arabic channels. Wow. They have. I just recently saw a Chinese uh, television uh, having a, a news channel and a, and a music video channel. So Chinese music videos so subtitled in Arabic um, with a, a Chinese host that speaks Arabic fluently. So uh, there is a real. It's a gold rush. Yeah. Um, people are saying this is a gold rush for the hearts and minds of the Middle East, where the resources lie, um, and everybody wants a piece of that. Fascinating, and it's really interesting that these trends are happening at two different levels. You know, you got the billionaires, but at the same time, you have these citizen journalists who are often very young. I mean, it's it's really quite yes. fascinating. Many of them are teenagers or in their early twenties, most yeah. probably. Yeah, wonderful. Well, I think this is the time of the evening we'll take questions. So please uh, pass your questions along. Thank you. Okay. 
So this is a question about the use of social media. Um, is this use of social media as a tool of protest, similar to the use of pamphlets in the populist protests of Europe and North America, i.e. the 1600s to 1700s? And don't worry, it's a librarian that asks you this question. So. <laughs> I'm not really familiar with the 1600s and 1500s uh, pamphlets. I imagine that these are not new trends and that definitely these are uh, uh, populist uh, media have uh, a trend across the, the world, definitely. I mean, uh, yeah. So let me, I mean, just to follow up on this question, you know, where are people getting their news from in the Arab world? What's the sort of number one, two, three source? Are they going first to the internet or is it satellite television? Is it print media? How would you sort of categorize it? Well, there aren't a lot of uh, a lot of information specifically, but um, we know that the ratings, the Al Jazeera, remains probably the most popular channel in the Arab world, um, and I think it will re remain that way for now. I think um, even Sky Arabia has just been launched. Murdoch's uh, partnership with the with the UAE uh, Prince, mm -hmm. um, and I've been watching the channel, and it's 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 you can tell that the, it's much less uh, in your face, less less of those kind of running videos down the street kind of thing. Mm -hmm. it's, it's kind of more sanitized or using kind of infographics. And I think that Al Jazeera has that, that spark still. It's mm -hmm. uh, keeping it um, very popular and that controversial, right. that kind of Fox News element maybe to some extent. Um, so, so yeah, I, 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 television is still the biggest medium right. in the Arab world, like, like I showed you, you know, people in containers, people in, in huts watching TV but increasingly having Blackberries yeah. and having internet connections. So um, some people tell me they get their news on Skype mm -hmm. now, uh, before they even, the news comes on Skype before it comes on the, the TV channels. Can I ask something, you know, because you notice this very well as much as, as anybody else, but there aren't a lot of advertisements on these channels, mm. which, you know, really leads to the suspicion that you've yes. probably heard, which is, you know, where are they making money? You know, they're selling the dish for $300. Mm -hmm. They're not charging the Arab user a monthly fee, and there's no advertisement. So what's going on? Yeah, it's not a good business. <laughs> Arab TV is not a good business. It's uh, the worst. I mean, if, you're, if you have millions of dollars, then you could just, you know, put it in some kind of fund or something and make money. Uh, the advertising market is worth around a billion dollars. It's not really clear also what to what extent there's exaggeration in the figures. And having a billion dollar market um, for a thousand channels, it's kind of difficult um, to sustain them, especially if some channels are spending $500 million to start up. Mm -hmm. So they're spending the half of the market. This is obviously a business of hearts and minds. Um, mm -hmm. It's a business where the profit is influence. It's not, this is at least for the big glitzy channels. And, right. and Al Jazeera, of course, is one of them. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, this, one of the senior editors at Al Jazeera told me once that uh, during the first few years of launch, uh, when it started to create this buzz, Saudi investors approached the channel and wanted to buy it for about $5 billion. And the Qataris decided not to sell. Mm -hmm. Why did they didn't sell? Because governments invest billions of dollars in public relations. And Al Jazeera was costing the Qatari government like two or $300 million per year. Um, and that was the best public relations anyone can ever imagine because this tiny little state we'd never heard of before and how better way to put your country on the map but to have a channel like that um, and so and even you know the billions invested in defense you know here is little Qatar right. influencing the region with, with, with you know without really any significant military so more and more people are looking at the power of broadcasting as a as a tool as a weapon as an influencer and that's really where the profit is. And, and so I don't think people are going into this business to make money. Um, and so it makes you think, consider what, what Rupert Murdoch is doing uh, in this industry as well. Interesting. Well, the irony, Bloomberg, Bloomberg in the Middle East is, is probably doing this at a loss in some way. Um, the well, I would also say that uh, the thing is, is that um, some of these joint ventures, probably like the Bloomberg venture and the Sky Arabia venture, you have to consider that uh, for these companies, they could find ways, probably, um, uh, depending on how things are, are, are how the books are, are yeah. kept. Um, uh, whereas the, the Emirati government might host the studios. They might you know, buy the studios. Uh, so there might be little investment for some of these big brands. Right. And they might be actually making money through you know, deals that they have. And there could be other deals. There could be other financial deals at stake. We know that Rupert Murdoch is in a lot of trouble right now. 
Um, so he might want to divest some assets. And why not? You know, people have suggested maybe the, the uh, Gulf countries might want to buy some of those assets. Mm -hmm. You know, so there could be some deals under the table here that we're not really aware of, and a lot of uh, uh, facilities that are provided at, at low cost. So. Um, there could be ways in which uh, it's really unclear the profitability very very few Arab channels of those thousand are yeah. profitable yeah and if it, any yeah I mean it really I mean you can look at the, the you know just sort of the landscape and it really is a conundrum mm -hmm. um, you know how are these channels making money under mm -hmm. the circumstances of mm -hmm. no subscription cost and, and as mm -hmm. I said uh, uh, unbelievable little amount of, of advertising mm -hmm. and, and it's sort of the reverse here <laughs> we, we well the only ads on Al Jazeera have a queue in them that's just, so Qatar Gas, Qatar Telephone, Qatar, all the government's <laughs> industries advertise. Everything in Al Jazeera has a queue in it. Um, and, and people don't want to advertise in Al Jazeera because Al Jazeera has this stigma. A lot of the big brands like Procter and Gamble and that, you don't see them mm -hmm. wanting to be associated with Al Jazeera. So they're going to El Arabiya, which is you know, getting, its, getting a lot of the market share. But again, you know, what is that cost to the government of Qatar to run, you know, having so much money to run this channel? It's, They've got their flag on Gaddafi's compound. Right. So, well, with an army of eleven thousand people, I mean, yeah. pretty incredible um, yeah. that it could do that with eleven thousand people and, of an army. Yeah. So, pretty incredible. Well, um, not all of them Qatari. <laughs> yes. Well, that's a whole other problem. Mercenaries is another issue. Um, this is a Tessa, from a student of the University of Waterloo. How are states who wish to remain authoritarian responding to citizen journalism? Um, well, as I said, you know, we've had this signal jamming. Uh, and we've had, you know, which is just another failed attempt to uh, by these governments to control the message and, and the clerics and the fatwas and all that stuff. Um, in Syria today, the new channels are, are constantly jammed. So people mm -hmm. have to go home every day and um, retune their dishes. And the channels keep changing frequencies. So that's how they get around that. The channels change frequencies. They post their frequencies online or on their channel. They say, we're changing to this frequency. Please follow us. And so it's, it's, a, it's a routine activity. You go home, you go, oh, we've got to reprogram the dish, spend like five, 10 minutes, and then all the channels come back again. Yeah. So again, it's, uh, they're making a little, you know, or in the case of Lebanon, broadcasters yeah. carrying their signal. Mm -hmm. um, so, and you know, and to talk about also the, 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 the Syrian new satellite channels while I'm on the subject, uh, some of them are becoming sophisticated. It's not all very amateur. Some of them have correspondence. Um, some of them, uh, they also have live, coverage so they can have people doing Ustream on their cell phones and sending it straight to the channel and you have uh, live feeds, so they split live feed, uh, feeds from different towns in Syria. Um, so people are saying these could become you know, big broadcasters in the future. Uh, they might join together, maybe the Sham with the Ugarit might come together, maybe some of these uh, small town networks. Uh, you know. I mean, There's a lot of opportunity I think also in the, in the towns and villages, big towns of, in the Arab world of a million people don't have much media. Yeah. Well, that follows up on one of the questions here. I mean, do you think that local media was more likely to be objectful and truthful than, say, some of the larger media networks like Al Jazeera and CNN reporting what's actually happening? Or are they too hand-picked and tailored? Um, I, well, this is the model, I think, that Al Jazeera English is following. Mm -hmm. And one of their slogans was, I think, um, Everywhere. Uh, uh, yeah, I think the view <laughs> from view from the ground, from, from wherever they're reporting from. So yeah. people from those areas reporting, not having journalists parachute in right. to countries and not know much about it, but we trust them because they look like us. Right. You know, we want people who are actually locals who can tell the stories of what's going on there. And I think that that has a lot of merit. I don't, I'm, I'm kind of skeptical of the idea that uh, a lot of big newspapers think that their correspondents have to be pulled out of, of, yeah. of, of, because they get too cozy and they get too local or whatever. I think that you know, we need to have more um, local views. What an interesting way of looking at it, right? I mean, that's fascinating because, you know, we, we have this sort of image of the war correspondent, right? You know, going from New York to the war zone and, and then, you know, leaving, but they never come with the, as you point out, the local context, the cultural sensitivity of what's actually happening on the ground. And, you know, we've been forcing this idea that we need to be objective. Um, and perhaps in Tongan news, it's about subjectivity, mm -hmm. you know, actually understanding the context yeah. of what one is reporting about can really, you know, portray the truth of what's happening. So yeah. it's a really interesting flip on, I think, what media studies mm. has brought for so many years, mm. traditional media at least. Yeah, I think that, I mean, there's no such thing as objectivity, and you're definitely not going to get it from somebody who 
who just you know brings with them also their baggage of, of yeah. what they perceive from and how they're going to look at local people and, and you know so I mean of course there are great many wonderful foreign correspondents out there that do great work uh, I just don't see any reason why we can't see more local media mm -hmm. and I think that ironically the the, the Syrian government's move of, of clamping down and closing down foreign media right. has really helped the Syrian local media I mean despite all the violence and the tragedy going on this kind of silver lining is that uh, people have been forced to tell their stories yeah. for the first time. You know, it's interesting, um, and this follows into the question that we have here, which is, you know, we, as we've seen, you know, Syria has obviously descended into more and more chaos, you know, the massacres in Hula and Kuber and, and other places. Um, we're starting to see some of those horrific images, and, and, you know, children is one sort of image that I think is a universal sort of, uh, it hits a universal chord in everybody's hearts. Um, do you think we will get to the point where we become desensitized? Um, you know, these sort of grainy, you know, even myself, even seeing these, you know, YouTube videos after a while, they all start to look the same. You know, um, is, there a, is there a danger that we become desensitized with the overload, particularly of sort of the YouTube genre kind of video? Yeah, I, I mean, um, we are becoming desensitized, obviously. Um, I don't know what, how that can be stemmed or whatever, but um, I think that it's also important to, to see things as they are. And I think that we censor a lot of things um, in, the, uh, in the Western media, especially the images, even Al Jazeera English, Al Jazeera Arabic, the images are yeah. far apart, um, the kind of carnage that we see. Um, yeah, I think that there is room for definitely more creativity in reporting events. I think that the coverage on Al Jazeera often is, is really like kind of aerial shots from buildings and people getting shot. And it doesn't really give you that personal mm -hmm. insider um, humanizing perspective and telling stories, rich stories, which is something that a lot of American broadcasters have done a great, and Western broadcasters have done a great job of over the years of honing in on that personal um, story. So, uh, and more, and kind of more, you know, literary journalism and uh, talking about scenes and places and, and, mm -hmm. and voyages and that kind of thing. I think there's a lot of room for that as well to kind of enrich the coverage from just these kind of shock and awe images that we're seeing. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you very much. Um, this has been enlightening. Um, but if I could just, uh, uh, just kind of um, pick up a little more, we, we really want to see uh, you know, and hear more about your work. So we'd love for you to tell us about sort of how you reach out to people. How mm -hmm. do you communicate uh, with the world and how many of these uh, great folks in the audience can, uh, can keep the conversation up? Yeah, well, I have a blog and you can please come to it. It's BeirutReport.com, one word, BeirutReport.com. Um, and um, I, I get on Twitter and um, I'm um, covering you know, all the changes going on in Lebanon in the region right now. So would really welcome uh, anybody to join the conversation, email me, comment uh, on the blog. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Habib Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yes, thank you indeed. Uh, thank you very much to our guest speaker, Habib Bata, and also our discussant, Bespa Momani, for the excellent discussion tonight um, for what you described as a gold rush. Uh, for the hearts and minds in the Arab world. Um, we certainly learned a lot about the new citizen journalists, the new startup networks, the city-based news brands. It was, I love the, the way you showed us these things. We were able to experience them here ourselves. Um, certainly we've been spoiled here in the West with all the glut of media we have. I confess our days when I would welcome a fatwa against uh, reality television uh, <laughs> in this society. But when societies that have been uh, repressed or voices have been uh, repressed, I'm, I'm sure it's one, we all agree it's wonderful to see all these new things uh, opening up, um, not just in politics, but even against uh, bad airline seats and all the rest of it. Uh, people pushing the boundaries. So thank you for introducing us to a lot of these ideas. And, uh, and I do encourage the audience to uh, check into his blog at BeirutReport.com. I'll just repeat that for you. And, uh, and I want to thank you once again on behalf of all of us. So.
couple of very brief notes for audience before we adjourn the video from tonight's uh, live webcast will be edited and posted to CG's website in our online video archive. I'd like to say thanks to the Balsley School of International Affairs for their support in making this lecture uh, a success tonight as well as CG's event sponsors 570 News and Wordsworth Books. Please also note the final CG signature lectures uh, in this season is coming up uh, on June 21st. That is the Canadian launch of a major CG report entitled Unleashing the Nuclear Watchdog, Strengthening and Reform of the International Atomic Energy Agency. CG Senior Fellow Trevor Finley will be here to uh, present his findings on how the IAEA has been performing and how it should be improved. And this is part of a worldwide launch. Yesterday, uh, the world premiere of this report was in Vienna, right near the IAEA headquarters. Uh, today, we were in uh, Chatham House in London, England. And, but it's coming to Waterloo on the 21st. Over the summer, stay tuned to our events calendar online so we can introduce you to what's coming up for the new season beginning in September. And thank you once again for coming to CG tonight. Have a safe journey home. So satellite TV networks like Al Jazeera that reach almost 90% of the region in some in, in places. So while you might not have internet, the broadcasters are out there and picking up these videos from the internet and broadcasting them to homes across the region. And um, you know, just to give you an idea here, I want to show you a, an image. Even in, um, you know, even in shacks, uh, this is a shack in Lebanon near a construction site. Now, Syrian workers in Lebanon live in these construction shacks, and they have no plumbing. Um, they wash themselves with buckets of water. Um, they make probably like $20 a day, but they have a satellite dish. And, and recently, I was talking to some people um, living in a container, in a rusted container, a group of uh, maybe 20, 25-year-old Syrian refugees, three months. Um, they had been living in Lebanon. They escaped Syria. And the first thing they asked me was if I could help them download Skype on the BlackBerry. Um, and they were living in containers. Um, why is Skype important? Uh, it's not just about Twitter and Facebook. Some people are using Skype now, uh, Skype groups, to broadcast news. So any way information is getting out, it's getting out there. And these people, they might not even know how to use um, email, but they know how to use Skype. So um, I think we need to be careful when we talk about um, the limited impact of social media, because it has many ways in which it reaches mass audiences. Um, now, these aren't just individuals that are out there filming these things. More and more, we are seeing a development, an evolution, I would say, um, where we have groups forming. OK? Um, let me get this for you right here. And so even, even you can tell the older generations that might not be connected are still you know, watching the main TV channels. This is a typical street in Beirut. Uh, people are out playing backgammon and watching TV through the window in their shop. So the TV so he's, he's saying that the town is under attack by the military aircraft. And that it also hosts a lot of rebel fighters in the town. Um, now, just like this man is running, telling a story, we're seeing this pattern throughout. We're seeing a whole generation of people that were never expected to be journalists, but have become reporters in their towns um, by force or by accident, and they're being trained as reporters in war, in the worst circumstances. Um, and not all of these journalists are just filming battles. Some of them are also doing a bit of reporting. You see in this report. On the humanitarian situation. So we can see the state of the the lack of uh, food, the garbage in the streets, people's issues, people's problems. These young uh, people, young amateurs, are going out and reporting, almost as journalists would, on the problems in their towns and cities.
forward here a little bit and see that uh, people are queuing up for food and water and a lot of scarce. People are trying to get gasoline, desperate situation. Why don't you go to school, he asked them, because the school is closed. Now, these videos get aired. Um, they're not just on YouTube, and they're not just available to people who have internet access, because we know that in the Arab world, uh, people on Twitter and YouTube and Facebook are a very small minority, about 1% or less in many cases. But these videos um, do get shown on the major Arab TV networks. He has a BA in journalism from the University of Texas, an MA from New York University. And just last year, he won the EU Samir Kassir Press Freedom Award for investigative journalism for his piece on uh, the Jewish uh, community in Lebanon. So please now welcome Habib Bata. Okay, how do I get this uh, going here? Get the screen on. The projector. Oh. Oh, okay. Um, there we go. So, um, thank you for coming. This is a picture um, of Gaddafi's compound in Libya. And when it was taken over by the rebels, we can see the flag of Qatar right there flying over it. Qatar is a very small country uh, with pretty much no military to speak of. Um, and Qaddafi's Libya was, had a massive army, one of the biggest in the Arab world, hundreds of tanks. Um, and yet this tiny little nation um, with, with, with a population under a million, well under a million, was able to hang its flag over one of the most powerful leaders uh, in the Middle East. So this is the, really the story of how powerful media has become in the Arab world as a tool. And we're seeing many governments now um, that want to start media in the Gulf countries. The Emirates has now a new channel. Um, Qatar, uh, Saudi Arabia has a channel. So we're seeing a lot of interest in this. But what I want to talk about today is these are all really big corporations sponsored by governments. I want to talk about people, young people, and um, the the citizen reporting and citizen journalism, which is now challenging even these challengers of other regimes. Um, so I want to show you. Uh, the, the, now, the Syrian government, like many governments in the Arab world, has tried to keep a lid on the media coming out of its country, it's tried to keep a lid on the message. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Center for International Governance, or CG as we say. Uh, my name is Fred Koontz. I'm the Vice President of Public Affairs at CG. Tonight's signature lecture is co-sponsored by CG and the Balsley School of International Affairs, located here at the CG campus. I'd also like to thank CG's public event sponsors, 570 News and Wordsworth Books. Besides the audience here tonight, we have a global audience watching on the live webcast. Uh, following tonight's address, we welcome questions from the audience either at the microphones here at CG or if you're watching online, you can ask questions to the live chat function on your screen and we'll transmit those questions to our guests. Our subject tonight is Broadcasting Revolution, How Media Have Influenced the Arab Uprisings. Our guest speaker tonight is Habib Bata, and I'll say more about him in just a few seconds. But first, I'd like to mention our discussant this evening following Habib's address, and joining him on stage will be Besma Momani. She is a CG senior fellow, a non-resident senior fellow at the Brookings Institution, and a professor of political science at the University of Waterloo and the Balsley School of International Affairs. A frequent commentator to the media, Dr. Momani is a global governance expert in Middle Eastern foreign policy and international financial institutions. Habib Bata is a Beirut-based journalist, filmmaker, and media critic. 
He's been covering Arab media for publications and broadcasters in the West and in the Middle East for several years. He's also contributed to CNN, Variety, BBC World, MTV, and others. He's focused mainly on social impact and public diplomacy at pan-Arab satellite stations, including the major Arab Gulf networks, Al Jazeera and Al Arabia, as well as an increasing number of Western and Asian state-backed outlets now broadcasting to the region in Arabic. Habib has covered Lebanon's media scene extensively and has written on mainstream and social media in Syria and Egypt in relation to the Arab Spring. Um, and it has failed, um, like many governments have in the Arab world. Um, because the Syrian government has clamped down, has stopped journalists from reporting in Syria, uh, or restricted their movement so severely that they can't report, uh, we have seen this emergence, this explosion, of citizen journalists covering the story, taking it upon themselves um, to, to make up for the lack of journalism in their towns and cities. And I want to show you an example of this entire year of war has been covered, one of the first wars probably, covered entirely, um, mainly, uh, to a large extent, by citizen journalists and not reporters. And this is what the kind of videos that we're seeing constantly in the Arab world today. A video from Homs, Syria, about two weeks ago. Oh, my God. 